Good evening one more time. Uh, I will invite our speakers to take a seat on the stage. Um, and also I will present to you all the speakers and present myself. I am Katerina Demirza. I am a philosopher and communications manager. And also I am affiliated in Vice Yefau and in Ivan Honcher Museum, the Museum of Traditional Ukrainian Culture. Uh, and the speakers and I will be moderating the discussion. So, and I am glad to present our speakers. The first one on the left is Hanna Rudik. She's a deputy director of the Hanenko Museum in Kyiv. Uh, the next one is Daria Predubailo. She's the founder of the NGO Art That Matters. And the third one is Ksenia Palsun. She's a co-founder of the NGO Renovation Map. And the last one is, <laughs> but not least, uh, is Eva Jakubowska. She's a board member of the NGO Vice Yefau. Uh, and uh, today we're gonna talk about cultural heritage and its preservation. And uh, at the beginning, I want to say a few words from myself and then give the mic to the speakers for some introduction words where they can also describe what they're basically doing. Because I named the organizations, but I didn't tell a lot of about them. And maybe some of you uh, doesn't know about them. Uh, but the first, uh, as I'm working in the Museum of Traditional Culture of Ukraine, uh, we have uh, something like a slogan there. It is called uh, a living culture. And it means that what we do in the museum and what we think about the culture, and especially traditional culture, is that it can only be our heritage, be our culture, if we live it, if we constantly repeat uh, being with it and doing something with it, interact with it, percept it, think about it, discuss it, and so on. And I'm glad that today we can also, for a short time, live uh, with Ukrainian culture in different dimensions. And uh, for the first word, uh, except of me, <laughs> I would uh, like to invite Hanna Rudik. Thank you. Hello. Oh, yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this important discussion. I'm Hanna Rudik. I am a deputy director for education of the Hanenko National Museum in Kyiv. This is the most, oh, it's not very humble to say most, but it is one of the most important museums of world art in Ukraine, founded on the turn of the 19th and 20th century um, by the Hanenkos, Barvara, uh, Bogdan and Varvara Hanenkos, Ukrainian art collectors, um, builders of cultural heritage of Ukraine, philanthropists, educators, uh, who uh, bequeathed their grand collection of world art, and it was only a part of their collection of different arts and antiquities, also Ukrainian art and Ukrainian antiquities, world antiquities, but there was also a collection of world arts, of Asian Europe and uh, classical antique art, that they bequeathed to Kyiv and uh, together with their main mansion on, in the center of Kyiv. And on the basis of their collection, um, the museum, the Hanenko Museum, uh, was developed during this 20th century. And uh, this is one of the very important museums for Ukraine, because as I have recently talked about that on my lecture last week, uh, Kyiv as a big city uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, but still a colonial city uh, from the point of view of Russian Empire, has no right to have 
a museum of world art or museum of world history. It was a great struggle to found there a museum of local history and local art, which uh, was named uh, after the emperor to had a right to found it. And it was founded also by the Hanenkos in the first place, but also by other cave activists of culture, and not cave, Ukrainian activists of culture. But Kiev was definitely not allowed to have a museum of world art. Only metropolises, Moscow and Russia, had that right. And Hanenkos, the Hanenkos, both of them, they paid quite a big price to get this right to bequeath uh, a World Art Museum and to establish World Art Museum to show and to actually to prove that Kiev is not a colonial city, but is a true center of culture. And owing to the struggle, to the resisting this um, uh, imperial and colonial oppression, we have now this museum, and it's a beautiful museum, which, as many of you probably know, was damaged on the 10th of October quite heavily. Uh, the windows were broken and the skylights fall down, fa fall, fell and fell down. And uh, this wonderful, unique Hanenko's interiors were also damaged uh, due to this explosive wave. Uh, but uh, we resist, we stand, and we um, have already um, uh, closed up the uh, closed the windows and uh, repaired the ceiling due to our volunteers, due to our partners, and uh, we do continue making uh, events in cave in, in in museum now. Although it's quite <laughs> complicated, given the absence of electricity and water, but we still. Um, intent to, 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 to uh, continue. So this is uh, the museum uh, which I've been working for 20 years uh, already and which I'm very deeply devoted to, although I'm here, not there, with my kids. Uh, and to add something about myself, I'm here um, working for the project um, um, in cooperation with TU University, TU Berlin, uh, the um, Department of um, Kunstgeschichte, uh, f and this project is devoted to decolonizing of museums in Europe, museums of Islamic and Asian art, as I'm curator of Islamic art for 20 years also. So it's, and uh, uh, to, to, to actually finish and um, uh, connect to our today's topic, uh, my, um, I think I consider my project on the theme of decolonization of museum narratives and practice, practices as an essential part of uh, preservation of cultural heritage. And we can later get back to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we will definitely come back to that uh, after all the speakers who have their first introductory words. And now, Daria, please. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. Um, so, uh, as the founder of uh, Art Matters Ukraine, um, and a curator, I'm doing, like, now, I mean, I must say that uh, for me, the, actually, the institution was founded back in nine, uh, 2019 at the reaction um, to the need to uh, promote and present Ukrainian contemporary art on the international art scene because I used to live in Germany and other cities in Montenegro and Cyprus. And I really saw that this invisible wall still exists between Ukraine and other countries, that Ukraine is still in this blind spot which um, makes so hard for Ukrainian uh, culture heritage and uh, contemporary artists to to be visible and to be uh, to be heard in the on the international art scene. So, basically, uh, the institution Art Matters Ukraine uh, was created to be the bridge to since um, and me like as a curator and founder, the one who the contemporary nomad, the person who can uh, cross the borders, travel and and build this um, connections, make them stronger. Um, that was the idea which I'm developing for the last three years. And um, 
like today, for example, I recently arrived from Kiev, so I'm here just from the train, um, and that's also really crucial for me and for the institution which I'm running to be present both in Ukraine and uh, internationally. Um, because this is something that the experience that you can have and feel with and, and trans transform it and transit it, bring it with you, with the projects, with the senses that you created. Um, so now uh, Art Matters Ukraine for the last few years was was be also um, working on the project uh, Blindstrom together with the great partners, National Art Museum of Ukraine and Goethe Institute Ukraine, uh, where we were um, this, making research around the special art collection, which was created back in the 30s and meant to be destroyed. And it's interesting how in 2022, when we were supposed to open it on the 4th of March at the National Art Museum in, in Kyiv, um, how this special collection reflects, like, which meant had uh, was created 100 years ago, reflects nowadays and the special operation. So with the word special, we really see how Russia, how empire, this imperialistic discourse is still present and how um, metropolis, how this imperialistic uh, empire and the center still continued like using the same patterns, um, which actually gives us several like questions important. How it, how come that in the 21st century we're still um, living this and, and, and believing this and, and following the same patterns? How happened that uh, this impossible war in the 21st century actually happened and who are and, and what are the responsibilities of different sides. So today for Art Matters Ukraine is also very important to um, involve different actors to the dialogue and that's why um, um, in September open exhibitions with which called a project which called Sirens are calling from the shadows and where both Ukrainian and German artists international artists were per participated and this project also has a discussion platform which uh, happened already in uh, Ukrainian Kiev in Ukrainian house uh, and will follow again next year in Germany uh, we will discuss uh, like build the dialogue and we'll try to find how um, this work can become a chance to really make the restructure of, of, of these patterns and the cultural context. So it's not just one uh, year or a sparkle of new Ukraine, you know, make Ukraine visible for a short time, but really develop new relationship and understanding uh, and the value of Ukrainian culture too. And I must say that uh, recently uh, when I saw Kyiv uh, in this blackout and, and driving into this total darkness, uh, it's re where Russia really want to put Ukraine and hide again the crimes under this darkness, to hide the uh, Ukrainian culture, to hide um, everything. Uh, and that's really terrifying, I must say. But not in the term of fear, because there is no fear, definitely, since Ukrainians know what we are fighting for, and this battle continues already for centuries. Um, again, hidden, as you saw, because it was always in this darkness. But I really hope that today, and this is something that uh, the role of different actors in different countries and our partners, uh, that this, these crimes have to be really shown, fixed, uh, and maybe visible and discussed later, because it can't stay in this darkness anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ksenia. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ksenia Palton. Um, I'm really glad to be here to represent uh, my NGO, where I, I'm a co establisher. We are a Kyiv based NGO called Mapa Renova uh, Renovation Map, Mapa Renovati. Um, we started to work together uh, in 2019. We started from the question why there are so many abandoned buildings and what we can do with it, because uh, we saw potential in it. And uh, we started our project from the um, to, cre to create a map uh, where we can put every data, every data we researched, collect, and check about the abandoned building, and that was our first project from which everything started. Uh, but um, 
as long as we are were working, we cannot stand aside from the other problems that were open for us, uh, such as uh, protection, the cultural, architectural, historical heritage in a, like in buildings, and uh, we started to participate in in uh, some different pr protection of the some specific buildings. We started to educate people we uh, now we have um, i would say a big and strong community uh, with the, which includes a lot of different initiatives that try to help and save such uh, buildings like kvite uh, ukraine flowers of ukraine sadiba uh, barbana we are friends we are helping each other we know how the community is growing how important for people for Ukrainians to save, to protect, to research our history, our heritage. And uh, we made the, this website with the, our buildings with the whole data. It's open for everyone, so if uh, there is some problem can appear with the building you live in or next with you, uh, you can go to our website to find all the data you can need to protect it. Um, during the last years, we started to cooperate with the uh, government, with the Department of uh, Preservation of Cultural Heritage, and we are collaborating in a, um, to give those buildings a status of a site. Um, there was a couple of those cases. They are uh, really long-term projects. Um, most of our projects now are long-term. Um, that's a specific of our work and we know that um, we will work for a long time. And uh, the last our project um, was about the researching of the Podil. It's a district in Kyiv. Uh, we took a part of it and uh, tried to uh, make a research with our knowledge to sh share how we can uh, protect, how we can research, how we can communicate with the government, with the different departures uh, together in this uh, beautiful our city. And uh, we invited people who want to become volunteers, who want to know and to use the knowledge how to protect or research something. So we made the research of the buildings and put them on a map. Um, and then the full full-scale invasion started, we were um, in, a, like in shock for some, for some time and then um, the new project appears. So we understood that we need to collect data um, on the territories that was damaged a lot because of the Russian invasion and their um, missile strikes, attacks, uh, a lot of heritage was damaged and uh, we need to collect those data and we need to check everything. There are a lot of projects now that are focused on such topic, but everyone is different in, in, in some ways and it's uh, really good that there are a lot of different projects because in the future it can help each other to collect uh, one big uh, picture what what's happened. Um, that's uh, the project we are working on and which is new now for us. Uh, it is a um, really long-term project as we um, decided to start from the um, Chernihiv, from Chernihiv um, region that was deoccupied, uh, deliberated by our Ukrainian forces and uh, now we can check uh, some information, we can cooperate with the Chernihiv government, with the authorities there and uh, to work together, which is really cool, but um, now we know that uh, it, it, like, it takes a lot of time to research everything. Um, yeah, and that's um, really shortly about the map renovation. In the future, I will take a different fields from what we have done. Thank you. Thank you. And please, Yeva. So I'm uh, today here to speak and to tell a little bit more about Vicha. Uh, so basically, Vicha started uh, in this genre 
but mostly all uh, members of which uh, it's in the past uh, culture or creative manager, artists, etc. And basically why I'm pointing out this to say that most of them has already organized in the past the international project in this creation field, artistic field, cultural field. And uh, also what I can tell from my own experience, mostly all the time, it was a huge struggle to get attention to some project when you was trying to make the um, cooperation between Europe and Ukraine in the way when he was coming and say, so we have a brilliant idea, let's do together some, I don't know, theater residence, for example, and uh, with Ukraine. The answer was mostly of this like uh, international, especially theater in this way. Community was like, we already working with East Europe, for example, with Russia. So basically, uh, it has become also the challenge for the long term for Vice to advocate Ukrainian culture, to build, to continue to build this subjectivity. And uh, to describe more of what and on what we concentrate themselves, it's, um, it's important to say what does mean culture for us. Basically, culture, it's the way of doing things. And when we are saying that we advocate culture, we mean we advocate this culture, the way how it's happening, tell more about Ukraine and in this way it's also a challenge for us to fight with Russian propaganda which is huge because Russian house here also huge and still exist and um, like right now the envir environment in which mostly exists like that we are uh, trying to help uh, this culture worker creative workers who are coming to Berlin who are staying here to get in touch uh, to another institution, to get some project which they can make by uh, support, which will be supported by some international partners. And on the end, we are trying to collect uh, goods for Ukraine. And uh, so basically, it's just shortly what, what we are doing. But uh, as I was asked to say some statement on the beginning, I actually prepared a statement. And uh, it's the fresh mail to which uh, from Serhii Plohi because right now uh, it's very important week and the next week and the next events they will be more important. Uh, it's the time when Bundestag in the second time sitting to recognize Holdemore as genocide. And uh, we have done already a couple activities and right now we are preparing some like statement to send uh, to media, to partners, to say why it's important to recognize. And because I also, when I was asked about and what I want to concentrate on our discussion, it will be the culture genocide. Because uh, uh, to understand why it's so important right now to give the voice to Ukrainian artists, finally, without this background, and pushing Ukrainian artists to sit together with Russian artists, and again, by pushing back this uh, to this imperialistic op optic to see Ukrainian culture as itself, it's also important to see the history and to recognize what was happening in history. And um, that's why I will quote right now Serhii um, Plohi about the why Holdemore should be recognized as genocide. Rafael Lemkin, the father of the concept of the genocide, defined Holodomor as essential part of the genocide against Ukrainian people by questioning his judgment on Holodomor, one questions the concept itself. And um, when we are reading and hearing these quotes, we also uh, need to keep in the mind that the genocide has not started like right now. And it's not just the Zufall, how to say in German, and in coincidence that uh, Russians target the culture uh, spaces that they bomb in Kamyana um, in uh, uh, East Ukraine. By doing this, that they erasing, they bringing back they trying to do this year zero of Ukrainian culture, trying to erase whole history. And they just, uh, as, how to say, has get this as legacy from the Soviet Union and has get this uh, legacy of the Soviet genocide against 
Ukrainian, which started 1922 and continue to happen right now. And it's what exactly which is doing, trying to show this to the world and advocate Ukrainian culture here in Berlin. Uh, thank you, Yeba. So uh, now we know a lot of information about uh, different types uh, and spheres of work of our speakers and their organizations. And now we're going to try to combine it all in our subject about the preservation of cultural heritage. So uh, we, uh, I think it's obvious for everyone in the room that uh, culture is important and the culture in times of Russian full-scale invasion, Ukrainian culture should be preserved and even more actively because it targets not only some territories that some people think that it's just some territorial war or political or anything. It's uh, definitely about erasing the whole idea of being Ukrainian. And this all we know, I hope, uh, so let's uh, concentrate on the ways how we can help uh, ourselves as Ukrainians and how people from other countries can help us too to preserve and what is being done now and what can be done in the future. So uh, my first question which I want to elaborate is more like a story how it started like uh, after the full-scale invasion, which were the first uh, moves that you experienced in your organizations and maybe in some others uh, were done to preserve? And were they like some mistakes or like what was done, for example? And how you see this from this point now, from like nine months after? Thank you, maybe. Uh, you can also decide whether you want to talk or not <laughs> and say it to me. I will not push uh, any. Okay, Hanna, thank you. <coughs> yes. Um, let's maybe structure our talk, um, dividing cu cultural heritage very conditionally, very roughly into tangible and in intangible, because uh, these um, presumably different parts uh, still um, uh, require different uh, um, measures to be protected. And if to speak, if to start with objects and buildings and tangible material culture, um, I can, I, I would like to start with these uh, immediate emergency initiatives which started already in Ukraine in February and Mar March, uh, which I personally uh, would recall uh, this um, heritage rescue has headquarters organized by Tustein and Maidan uh, Museum, Museum of Revolutionary of, Dif of Dignity, and also very similar in their um, focus uh, museum crisis center in Lviv, organized by uh, Olga Honchar and the uh, Museum of Terror, uh, uh, Territory of Terror Museum. Uh, both of the initiatives were aimed for fundraising and for aid, um, material aid and aid of advice, uh, logistical aid to regional museums, first of all to the museums that uh, occurred under occupation or could be uh, soon um, uh, find themselves under occupation. And there are a huge work has been done. I don't, uh, I, I can't, can't uh, tell you some numbers there, but I know a lot of cases like Lugansk Museum that moved to Lviv and started working there very efficiently, very soon. And there are many collections were evacuated to um, Western Ukraine and a lot of materials for conservating, for storing, for transportation uh, were, um, um, given to, to, to transport it, shipped to the eastern and central Ukraine, to um, southern Ukraine. So uh, really a lot was done for the museums in regions. And um, in parallel, uh, in Europe, uh, here in Germany and internationally, 
uh, many analogous initiatives were also started, like in Poland, this Polish um, Museum Pomocy Ukraine, um, it's kind of, um, I don't know, center or initiative for uh, help to Ukrainian museums, which united 40 museums in Poland, and actually um, uh, provided this material um, help to Ukrainian museums. Then here in Germany, uh, a grand work has been done by um, a collaboration of uh, art historians and other um, representatives of other institutions. It's called Netzwerk Kulturgutschutz Ukraine. And they by um, now uh, this initiative has shipped 30 big trucks uh, in total of 46 tons of materials and equipment of different kinds for different measures to be taken starting from boxes and uh, files for storing, for safe conservation of the collections of the museum collections, archival co collections, li uh, libraries, and fight fighters and all kind of fight fighting equipment and air dehumidia dehumidiation, de dehumidiers, I would say. I'm not sure, sorry. So, um, uh, means um, and equipment for transportation, for marriage and conservation of collections. So, it, every two weeks, a lorry uh, was sent to Ukraine, and it was not only to Kyiv, to Sumy, to Chernihiv, to Odessa, but also to plenty of original museums, which otherwise could have had no help and um, it was very customized, very smart help, because before sending, before actually assembling these materials, um, the museums were asked, what do you need for, uh, what do you need most right now? What particularly do you need? And it was very, very um, like personally um, addressed uh, aid. And again, we cannot but tell about Ali Foundation, which, by now, as far as I know, allocated already three million of US dollars to 110 museum uh, museum projects in Ukraine. Again, uh, helping with materials, helping with equipment, helping with ideas, helping with 3D scanning of architecture, which is quite different, which is even more about knowledge, about intangible heritage, but also about the objects themselves that in case of damage or destruction could be renovated, remembered, restored. So it's um, um, this part of help, this part, this very positive histories about mutual aid, about emergency aid, um, about very flexible and very fast and mostly horizontal level aid. But, uh, Ali Foundation, it's an international alliance under somehow connected with UNESCO, it seems to me, but still it's, it's a collaboration of certain um, uh, players on this uh, international cultural, cultural heritage field. But still, when we speak about protection of objects, of material property, we all are very realistic, uh, are very sober, that no object, no building, no monument situated in Ukraine right now can be considered protected or guaranteed in security and safety. And um, this is the reality we face, and uh, there are plenty of proofs to that. You perfectly know many of them, I think. And this ministerial platform which collects, which registers cases of destruction and damage, it's only a part that, uh, of the information, but it's still very important that they do that, that any person can add to add, uh, register the case of destruction of criminal, of this war crime in culture there. And now there are, uh, uh, yesterday I checked specially to, to see how many 
uh, of the cases are there. And there, there are um, around 600 now, but minister mentioned 800 recently. So they know probably more and that are not registered. But we all, I think, uh, know that there are many more of them which just cannot be now reached and registered. So I would finish with uh, the idea that the probably the most efficient measure to protect objects here in Ukraine is to strengthen Ukraine air defense and um, to stop shelling, to stop bombing. And this is, uh, of course, a diplomatic, a political um, field, but it is also a field of cultural policy. And we can later talk how can we uh, try to, to, to foster the decisions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And also thank you for this division on tangible and intangible. I think we also will get back to it uh, later because it, there are different levels of preservation and what can be done and should be done. And maybe, you, Xenia, you want to add on the... Mm, yeah, yeah, I would add to this question as um, it's generally our main um, theme, the, our focus to protect the heritage, uh, the architectural heritage, and mostly in Kyiv for those time. Uh, the first months, is to be fair, we were shocked as we are mostly volunteering organization. We are a volunteering organization. We are uh, full um, consists from the volunteers and our community is a volunteering people, it's just citizens who care. And uh, f during the first months uh, a lot of uh, change uh, come to our personal lives and it was hard to be really focused on some topics and start something uh, to do something really good. But uh, during the f even the first weeks, we um, saw that in the some cities, the city authorities or just people started to cover uh, monumental heritage, some sculptures, some uh, precious windows, uh, buildings, protect from the explosion wave that could appear and uh, from the from the bombing, from the airstrikes. Um, that was uh, in a lot of different cities uh, in all over Ukraine, and uh, I know that some uh, cultural uh, workers from the Poland, they uh, voluntarily bought some materials and sent to the uh, Department of the Preservation um, of cultural heritage in Kyiv so they can uh, decide how they can use those materials, what uh, should they protect. And uh, as they have the, all the data, they have all the registers, they know what, what they can do. And um, that was this kind of horizontal work. A lot of organizations started to help to another organization like uh, from the international community b which they know already. Like if you had some connections with the other organization, they uh, started to help, they asked you uh, what can we do or um, how can we help by some, just uh, by our knowledge, right? And uh, after some time we started to, with our volunteers, with our friends, to protect a small objects uh, that were in Kyiv, and they are still in Kyiv. Uh, the first one was uh, the um, really important, uh, beautiful windows on the funicular in Kyiv. Uh, a lot of people who lived in Kyiv, they know how precious, how beautiful they are, and they uh, can be really, um, can be apart from their memories from the childhood, though it's a really strong connection to the people in the city. And uh, the first project of map renovation in a such way were to protect those windows. Um, then we decided to uh, protect a sculpture from the his architectural site in the center of Kyiv. Uh, this is still um, is uh, under the work, we did not finish it yet. 
Um, so it's uh, this type of new activities that uh, started from the beginning of the full-scale invasion. It's to protect what we can. We cannot protect every building as it, some of them are still in use, and mo most of them are in use, life is still going on, right? We cannot just uh, block every window to protect them from the explosion wave and uh, so on. So we can just um, waiting and uh, hoping that there will be not something bad and protect what we can. So we started from the small objects, and a lot of people does some activities like this. and. Um, what I wanted to add is that um, one more activities became really important those times. It's a 3D scanning of the architectural heritage. Uh, there were a lot of uh, such organization in Odessa and Lviv, in Kyiv and Kharkiv, a lot. And uh, now they started to collaborate between them. They started to collaborate with the other volunteers from the friends, from the other who have equipment. So they tried to uh, make those um, 3D scanning to because they know that it is really hard to fully protect the buildings, uh, really uh, big um, objects. But they can uh, use those data uh, to restore it, to make it to make it live again after if something will happen. Um, there are some difficulties now because uh, you need to have all the permissions to have to make the scanning and uh, especially in the deoccupied territory or if it's in Kharkiv, it is really hard. And the same if you want to protect something like a smaller, like uh, some objects, you need to be sure you are not doing it worse with your work because you can um, you can damage it just to by building something with uh, some instruments and it, everything is really fragile uh, so it, it's better to have a permission with the uh, local authorities and um, yeah I forgot what I wanted to say more let it be the end thank you <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we talked about objects a little bit and about small ones, like small in uh, when we compare them with buildings. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, and it was it what was done at the beginning. And for example, now I think when I was thinking about our discussion, and I was thinking about museums, for example, that all collected and gathered together their uh, objects, their artworks, and then uh, bought this uh, hum humidity dehumidization things so that the uh, humidity in the room stays the same and stuff like this. And now I think about blackouts that are happening. And uh, does it la work still? Uh, for me, it was really a question because if we imagine some basement uh, where the whole materials were brought and gathered and then specific heating was included and this humidization things, and when the electricity doesn't work, they also doesn't work. And then what happens to the objects? And uh, is it now a big struggle for museums? And I am afraid for that for many museums it's a big problem, uh, but I know that uh, 100 generators have sent very, very powerful, and I hope some of them will go to the museums, uh, but of course they first will go to hospitals. Uh, but our museum has uh, very good generators. Uh, bought uh, long a few years ago, or even many, maybe up to ten years ago, when we realized that we are very much dependent upon the fluctuation in uh, in electricity. So we stand well in this aspect. But uh, the generators are needed for collections, of course. So yeah, uh, and this also opens the question about uh, intangible uh, heritage because uh, objects are fragile and they, if they are on the territory of Ukraine and most of them are there still, uh, they can be destroyed every minute 
we don't know how like we don't know how we can protect them especially buildings for example it's easier to crush and it's harder to restore although if you talk about artwork it's impossible to restore in the same way like it will not be original in the end but uh, how you all speakers uh, see this uh, preservation of cultural heritage in the meaning of sharing knowledge living the culture like what other uh, possibilities not just to store object because even if they are stored somewhere they are not used and they are like dying uh, i'm I just i'm using the metaphor of my colleague in the honcher museum who's uh, usually work with uh, embroidery shirts and every day when she goes to the work she says hi to some of the pieces because and she needs to say hi to all of them in some period of time because otherwise they will be sad and uh, not used and she should like uh, connect to them and she knows that not every shirt can be exposed explained in the museum at some point so but everyone every of them needs attention and this is the same with every other cultural objects they need attention they need communication between each other in the museum space in the digital space and so i want uh, you to elaborate on the other possible ways or what was done to make this attention preservation happen I just can add, I think, to the blackout because uh, on the 23rd of October, like November, sorry, um, when there was um, another attack on Kiev, I had a meeting with the director of National Art Museum of Ukraine, Yulia Litvinets, and we were sitting together in the total darkness. Uh, discussing exactly um, the collection and uh, our project because um, the, the one that was supposed to be open and it was already uh, almost in fully installed um, on the 24th of February. Um, like now we, we are discussing how we can actually present it to the audience uh, and how we can um, bring the art to the society. That was the idea and to, to discuss it. So um, basically being in this total darkness, but anyway, we understand that the, and this was Yulia uh, Alexandrovna said, that museum anyway is a living institution, it's a living organism, so nothing stopped. Uh, any missiles, any war can't stop really the process, the culture, and we see it because today while we are here with you in this safe space in Berlin, our colleagues in Ukraine, Mestets Kersnal, opened an exhibition. Uh, which is called Heart uh, of the Earth. And I think it's fantastic. And it's also the way of resistance for um, Ukraine, for Ukrainian society, for culture. Um, and yeah, being in this total darkness, but anyway, feeling how life is going, it's something very important that I think we should really remember always and take from this war as a treasure, understanding that this, you know, that there is a live process uh, because again what uh, for many years many times and centuries um, Russia tried to do with Ukraine is actually to block to stop to ruin everything to to um, liberate it yeah so um, first uh, this like opportunity to to show um, in the online for sure uh, and that's luckily some museums done their job and scanned projects and uh, one of the options anyway to 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 bring it online and to uh, um, to transform it because we already had this experience in the during the COVID but now working like me are and for my institution Art Matters Ukraine working with the uh, partners National Art Museum we really try to to um, to bring it aside and not to stop it, not to block ourselves. Uh, another option uh, is, of course, to bring artworks um, abroad, bring them to the international audience, and that's of course difficult process because we're speaking about your heritage uh, and difficulties and. Uh, and also uh, damage, potential damages that could be done on the way and destructions, yeah. Uh, so it's a highly risky process, uh, which is controlled by Minister of uh, Culture of Ukraine, um, very precisely. But at the same time, it's, um, again, the dialogue should be continued and several works from the project, uh, which I'm curating, will go uh, also to different exhibitions. Um, 
And my, what I'm personally working now um, is a Ukrainian cabinet, so some uh, interventions to uh, German museums, uh, to German collections, because as we know that usually art projects are really planned in museums for a long time, for two years at least, and it's hard to bring the very big project uh, exhibition uh, complicated and um, to find the space and resources inside the museum. But what we can do, and uh, this is another potential, what I see is really to make interventions uh, into the collections or also work with the, mm, yeah, like with the museum's um, collections here and build the dialogue how it can work and build somehow like I call them Ukrainian cabinets it's something that this uh, like maybe additional like places and rooms where we can um, rethink the uh, the heritage and uh, and again make visible something that was um, written under Russian, for example, avant-garde. Currently I'm doing research at the uh, avant-garde, Archive de avant-garde in Dresden and where uh, one million and a half of items exist and there is even no uh, folder with a Ukraine or any name that you can find Alexander Exter, Malevich or Burluk they are under Russian avant-garde, Russische avant-garde and um, for sure now everyone like surprised uh, but for example Alexander Exter, uh, how Alexander Exter can be not Russian uh, but Ukrainian artist but uh, we also from the side of museums and Ukrainian archives can prove that for example Alexander Exter used to work in uh, National Art Museum of Ukraine as an exhibition designer. So this very lively process should continue um, but with a lot of attention and resources for sure and in different formats. Um, but really important to have this, yeah, to, to find this space because this process which we're doing now, it's a long one. I will add then, uh, because it's exactly um, what we are doing with Vicha, I will say, of course, we are not um, like protecting some uh, our artifacts, uh, but um, the work, how, um, I will start from another um, from another side uh, to answering by your f to your first question. Basically, I think it was um, it was something what you have in your background in your mind as the full scale invasion broke out. What actually culture workers started to do evacuate themselves and trying to save the lives because uh, exactly in that time, 1922, Soviets invaded and occupied Ukraine back then and started to do genocide action by destroying, like by killing intellectuals, uh, uh, scientists, uh, artists, uh, engineers, etc. And um, precisely what all started to do, started to do to work uh, in uh, this case in Vichy, but I think it was some common, common thing to all of us, as you said, that you also has not started to think about this, you started to think to about to protect a life because it's exactly what Russia is doing, taking the life. And exactly that Russia is doing with the culture, taking the life, by uh, bringing this fake around, by saying about the Stark, Malevich, that it's like Russian artists, but taking their life, by destroying this, um, by erasing definition that it's Ukrainian, by erasing the concept that it's Ukrainian or it's Ukraine. And exactly that was declared, but it started uh, much more earlier. And uh, we have seen this also in this perception of Ukrainian art here. And basically, to say how we are right now protecting and saving this culture heritage of Ukraine here in Europe, we have the small, small window right now, the chance to finally raise the voice and speak about the past to show what was happening and to what was also um, what also and where also Europe has supported Russia by erasing Ukrainian culture and for example right now finally really slowly very difficult but we are getting this chance to speak sometimes of course uh, it's not very like this uh, this voice which we expected that will be given us as for example this first demonstration where Ukrainian activist first in the life was called to speak in the huge demo but uh, uh, 
by organizers completely ignore all their background, the PhD definition and their uh, field of expertise, they name them just Ukrainian voices. But still, we are getting this chance to get the attention and, for example, to fight and to speak about Lenin. Of course, it's bringing heart attack and tears on the eyes for people who was believing and still believe in him. Or to speak about Ziggy Zoyle with Stalin portrait and Stalin quotes in this monument. Or about the Pro Treptower Park where we have seen, where we can still see Stalin quotation. And, um, why it's important for us to do that uh, we need also to protect our past because it's very dangerous to give to the dictatorship which was uh, given uh, by this international community which uh, sometimes trying to be in this good relationship with the Russia and sometimes even now. And uh, for us it's very important to speak about this, to raise the voices, uh, actually to give a more uh, floor to speak to our colleagues from Ukraine, in Ukraine, who are continuing to protect. And I think here will be very interesting. So far I know in uh, Hanenko Museum you're making tour uh, all through the, uh, even through the uh, artifacts is uh, hidden, right? So, and it's like brilliant uh, how you can pay yeah. attention to this yes. artifact. Yes, uh, coll uh, colleagues, my colleagues developed a tour around the building and its histories, its entangled and complicated, difficult histories of the Hanenko mu Museum. But not right now, after the October air strike, there is no uh, such tours. Hopefully, we will be able to restart them. Yes, yeah, so basically, it's uh, um, by bringing attention to this. Uh, unfortunately, still culture, and it's really dangerous, don't bring so much attention to the politician by sending finally these two extra promises, Iris, which is still not sent it, just the one from them is sent it, uh, which, is, uh, which could close uh, the sky in this diplomatic way if they want. And um, like, it's the time, and it's very important that uh, traditional justice for the past century finally will happen here in Germany as well. And Finally, these voices which was taken uh, out from Ukrainians will be ba given back. Thank you, Yeva. Uh, <laughs> and you touched uh, a good point about this uh, moment of attention without understanding uh, that we uh, usually people who are trying to bring something to Europe or other uh, countries, <laughs> although Europe is not a country, uh, I think you understood me. Uh, so th that they facing a lot of uh, misunderstanding and that uh, and also seeing this uh, Ukrainian artists that we know that they're Ukrainian in different museums uh, in the Metropolitan, Mu Metropolitan Museum in New York that they are signed as Russian and then starting this really slowly and really bureaucratic work to uh, defend your own artist. And it's a huge work done by uh, a lot of Ukrainians that uh, happen to be in these places now and have finally the possibility to do this. But it's still like these small pieces uh, done and we still face this uh, wall of misunderstanding because of past centuries and because of what was uh, done before. But now uh, we also have something that we already lost and I think we need to uh, remember it too because we have, uh, yes, totally we have museums uh, that are saved now, that have saved uh, for now their objects, we have cultural workers, uh, artists uh, that went to other countries and do their something, uh, present themselves, present Ukrainian art, but still we have a lot of uh, Ukrainian artists from different spheres who fight for Ukraine, who die for Ukraine now, for freedom. We have uh, museums and other architectural heritage too, which was already bombed and 
and uh, artworks that were stolen and brought to Russia. And uh, I want uh, to think about the possibility of their renovation, restoration, bringing back. Uh, what do you think, whether, like, how we can work for it now and how it can happen in future, like how all, like what we have lost uh, and whether we can bring it back, for example, like making this, uh, bringing back Malevich to MoMA Museum, making him Ukrainian, but bringing back some pieces that we lost uh, during this eight years also. I can try to start uh, uh, this theme, to, to, to discuss this theme. Well, it all depends upon particular uh, situation, because um, as we previously uh, discussed in tangible heritage, uh, the critical measure uh, of saving intangible heritage, that is knowledge and memory and narratives, is digi digitization and saving digital archives somewhere outside Ukraine on some cloud storage storages. And there are lots of international uh, initiatives, also grassroots initiatives that do that for Ukraine and has uh, have already done a lot of um, work. So every museum uh, whose archive is uh, whose collection is digitized and stored somewhere safely has a chance to be renovated, even if the uh, house, the building, and even if the staff, the personnel is not anymore there. And this work on digitizing and saving uh, digital archives is is critically important. Is what Ksenia told about 3D scanning. It is critically important to do now. As to the part of the collection that is lo of collections of heritage that is looted, uh, taken to Russia from Crimean museums, from Donetsk, from Melitopol recently, from Kachovka yesterday, uh, it appeared in the news, from Kherson museums. Um, well, we know the long history of this ex extraction, of this looting, uh, many centuries of history, and I personally, as a museum curator, I did provenance research of two very important pieces of Islamic, and one of them is actually pre-Islamic Persian art, the unique uh, object found on the territory of Ukraine and uh, testifying to the connections and relations of uh, Ukraine of the 13th century and uh, Ukraine of the 7th century, 6th century, was Persia, uh, which were taken uh, just by force to Hermitage because uh, it fit well into their gap in this. Uh, of this information, of this uh, object. Mm. Uh, so, and um, so far nothing was returned back from Russia. There are lots of things and you probably know more than I do, but they um, were not returned, but upon our victory, and upon Russia be a subject of, um, of the international court procedures. I'm pretty sure that everything will be reconsidered and uh, the reparation and repatriation of this um, uh, heritage is possible. I personally hope to live until that time and see that. Uh, so, um, but what um, Yeva touched, what is very important, and you too, you touched upon the heritage that is already lost. Lost with people who are producers of culture. And um, it's un unwritten novels and written music, unstaged dramas, theater performances, everything, and this is really a huge loss, which for me is, un, uh, uh, cannot be com compensated. I can't think of any um, measure. 
But that, this emphasizing the importance of the support of cultural workers of all kinds, of museum cura curators that uh, keep the knowledge of those museums that are not still digitized. They manage this knowledge. They know where information is and how it is structured. Artists, composers, all kind of people of creativity, they all need support, physical sometimes, even more physical recently, but also psychological, emotional support, financial support. That is what our director, Yulia Vaganova, is very uh, preoccupied now to support the team, to support people who work in the museum, uh, who come to the museum every day, despite the absence of water and electricity and heating, who uh, keep on um, conservating some objects better, making them safer, and who keep the knowledge, and who will or are already reconsidering this knowledge and rethinking narratives that we were repeating for more than a century now, and many of which are still very imperial narratives, both, um, and colonial na narratives, both of Russian um, origin or Russian second-hand origin from Western uh, colonial in empires. And while Germany, together with other European states and German culture is recolonizing itself, you also are to start this decolonization. Uh, work, this movement, and museums are an important part of it. So we come to the narratives that are told from our own point of view, from our perspective. And all these people are to be supported. And this is why all events that you, Daria, and you all, Vicha, is organizing here in Germany for uh, to giving voice to Ukrainian cultural representatives, activists, to highlighting them, to making exhibitions, to making concert, to make con uh, making concerts, uh, making panel discussions, um, making them visible, making them supported, and being able to do their work, because this work is crucially important. They are processing and sharing this absolutely borderline experience of loss, and anxiety, and uncertainty, and death, and of patriotism, of solidarity, of self-sustainability, of humbleness, of altruism. And this is our cultural heritage, which is being created now, and which is to be supported very much. I want to add that uh, in the discussion which you moderate uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the discussion which took, po took part um, Igor Kozlovsky, Ukrainian philosopher, and uh, Kornyi Hrytsuk, Ukrainian director on the premiere of Yerudan Baz movie. And it was a very sweet moment when each of uh, them has declared um, another person as uh, Ukrainian heritage, culture heritage. And it's exactly what you're speaking about, that, uh, yeah, actually, it's, uh, we cannot, unfortunately, as we see what does mean Russia, it's completely death to everything alive, to everything what is having light inside. Unfortunately, we could not be sure, uh, sure that some uh, protected monument which is standing even in city center of Lviv could be really protected and will be not erased. But the people could be protected. And that's why I think on the beginning of the full-scale invasion, people started to evacuate, started to work in this like very simple level to, of existing, like to bring back the life, to save the life in each condition. And the same is right now, and uh, basically what is very important and what is actually, to be honest, we was a little bit harsh today, but still partners, even in Berlin, as our partners Akut is doing, it's by bringing the stage to Ukrainian artists. As you see, we sitting here speaking finally about the culture, heritage, how to save this without any Russians here. So it's so incredible, we can speak finally about Ukrainian heritage 
with Ukrainian voices. It's not very often a thing uh, in Berlin, I could say, before the full-scale invasion. And basically, by giving the microphone in this more metaphoric way, we can save Ukrainian culture right now and the future of this culture. Because as, uh, as we see, we have and uh, what have inside Ukrainian, and I would like to think about this as like kind of some common thing, some tradition that Ukraine brings the life, their building, as we have seen in these decoupied cities in the Kyiv region, and as we will see in each other region, I hope and I wait for this. And uh, it's about that, and it also could be as uh, some very important for the future generation analyze of the kind of Unite unity inside of the country, which could be called as patriotism. We have seen uh, this in Russia in the way of hate to other people, and we have seen this in other part of history already, and we, as we have seen this in Ukraine, to be united because of the, I'm sorry for this pathetic, but because of the love. And it's actually this, this is the future, and this for what Ukraine fighting for. Um, I want to add to this question and to come back to the objects, um, <coughs> to the architecture. Again, um, I, love, I love to look at the architecture uh, as uh, like a book that tells you a story. And if uh, people, as an agent of the culture, can create, uh, recreate, uh, change a lot during their life. The buildings cannot, but they can still tell you a lot of different stories that can affect on you, that can make a difference. And um, I want to say what we lost uh, during these eight years already. It's eight and a half, almost nine years, almost ten, oh my god. It's like a long term, and uh, we cannot say for sure how many. It's impossible. And we will calculate it for a lot of time, even after the, our winning, our um, freedom. But um, it is really important to say about the occupied territory, Luhansk, Donetsk, and Crimea, uh, because um, what Russia is doing, they are um, erasing some words in the sentences, and they make this sentence, um, this sentence became different because there are something missing, but they are using this message in their own uh, willing. So uh, the same with the history. The buildings are representing different events, uh, direction of our history, which has a big uh, numbers of different events. Yes, uh, we have a lot of culture that was affected on us, that we made on other, and um, uh, so Russia tries to erase some um, remembering what was in our history. And through the past, they are trying to, um, to rule this past, right? To create their picture of the past. And through this, to rule the future. And it is really important to understand. Um, we cannot say what we lost in the Luhansk and Donetsk, but I was um, making small research about the Crimea, and there are a lot of activists, a lot of people who stayed in the, under the occupied authorities, and they are trying to protect their heritage. It's a lot of Crimea Tatar, it's their home. And they are trying to protect their history that are archaeological uh, objects, it's um, architectural objects uh, that are saying that it, this is their home and it's the last pieces that can tell it. And um, a lot of activists from the Crimea keep saying that um, Russian authorities, they are uh, choosing what to preserve and what to not. And a lot of, especially Crimean Tatars, um, historical architectural heritage is not not is un, is not under protection. They are just inactive in this field because they know 
uh, what should be preserved. And um, it's the, there are a lot of um, problems there with the um, construction works um, with the heritage that they are doing there. And the um, so-called restoration processes that are not really re restorative processes there. Um, in, like in Ukraine, all the work they are doing with the heritage, we say it's illegal because we did not give a permission for it, right? We cannot control it. And uh, they, uh, those works cause damage to those um, sites. And uh, there are a lot of sites that are uh, in the list to UNESCO's World Heritage. It is really important. There are like fortress system, a, a big, big system of the Crimean, of the Tatars, uh, Turkish uh, culture that um, keeps um, rem like rem remember that uh, their culture were uh, connected with the West Europe. And this is really important for Russia not to not to show, you know, because they are trying to say that Crimea, like it's it's not about the Crimean Tatar, it's it's all about the Russian. They mixed people a lot during the Soviet Union, and people felt no home. They felt no place at those new cities, right? And the architecture and the stories beside the architecture, who lived there, uh, the um, agents of the culture, um, the poets, the artists, uh, they are. Um, they can help you to feel at home, to understand what is your identity there. So um, now, uh, by the project of uh, their one platform by the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine, uh, they are calculating some objects that were damaged by the war, starting the full-scale invasion only, and there are 529 objects uh, there. But uh, three days ago, I saw a message from the Ministry of Culture that there are eight, near 800 objects that damaged. And these are uh, different types of them. And um, it is really important to tell the story that those, in my case, architecture tells us. Um, as, like, again, uh, I can come to the Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, did you know that the um, Azov Stal uh, production before the Soviet came and uh, remake it, uh, improve it, rebuild it? Uh, on it was a factory. It was the production that was made by Belgium and German people, actually. Nobody knows that. I, I, like, it seems like nobody knows that. And Russia, um, Soviet Union, that was ruled from the Moscow, um, they were erasing those connections with the Europe that we had during the whole Soviet times, and that are doing the same now. So uh, it is really important to tell those story that we lost and that we still have. And we... <laughs> I totally forget this tradition to applause after each answer. <laughs> Uh, I not get too used to this, but uh, to add to what you said, we know what happened in Donetsk, uh, for example, and what happened with the art space Izolatsia. It's become to be concentration camp. So we see in this what is Russia doing on occupied territory. I just want to add shortly, shortly, because I think really important. We speak about the cul like our cultural heritage in terms of museums and architecture, but also we should not forget about. Um, private collectors that also losing like my, my myself I know that um, um, private collectors and uh, collections that were on the occupied territories they also lost some important works of both Ukrainian and Western artists like international artists so this is also something that I think we should include in the conversation because these are also very strong and important agents cultural agents and um, like private collectors uh, and basically who are the guardians of the culture. Everyone is. And especially private collectors as well as the museums, they really cover this important part to preserve the culture heritage. 
And another one is uh, collections of artists, like their own works. Um, artists who had to flee, the, who left their studios. Um, unfortunately, they also lost opportunities. And also now with the blackouts, how many artists actually have good studios in Ukraine that can preserve their works properly? Uh, from one of my good friends, Alevdina Kahidze, uh, um, for the first two or three weeks of the invasion, she was just really preoccupied and terrified about her works, her own uh, practice for the last 20 years. She, um, that was her nightmare to, like, to lose it. And um, by the way, it's interesting because I really, um, traveling back and forth, there is a something from Alcina Kahidza which I hold. <laughs> yeah, this is a piece which I, um, I bought from her um, like right with a few days before the invasion and we were talking about the business and the new projects and I, I bought a piece because I have a collection of uh, art, contemporary Korean art by myself and for me it's also important to support artists in this way by buying their works and I'm really inviting you to do the same by the way. <laughs> so and this piece actually um, traveled with me everywhere, like it's almost symbolic already. Uh, it's so, so, so important and Alotina, if you see that, I say hi, I'm grateful. I was crying with this, I was laughing. And uh, first time when I saw Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian artists in, uh, in Venice in the end of April after when we met all together and actually that was the first feeling that, yeah, all the art, all the objects is so important, but to see the, your colleagues, to see artists, actually this is the, the, the most important, the, the heritage that we have um, and that we have to carry about each other um, strongly. Yeah, thank you. Just emotional, but really, I really wanted to share with you this. And in every speech uh, we mentioned uh, community and how it's important that even if everything will be digitalized and there will be no one who understands what it is in these digitalized copies and stuff like this. It will not uh, be renewed and will not live a uh, new life. And we have a community as an audience here, and I can <laughs> invite you for questions now, although I have a bunch of few left by myself, but I would like to give you the mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, um, uh, regarding the part of decolonization practices, that the very important part of uh, preserving our art, um, and regarding that we encounter um, with a lot of German institutions and intellectuals uh, that used to work with the decolonial practices, especially uh, regarding, uh, for sure, colonies and usually in this establishment uh, level of uh, German cultural workers, uh, there is um, this idea that Ukrainian arts, um, it's not right to name it decolonization process. So it's a lot of debates uh, as uh, I was a witness uh, that it's not proper uh, term for Ukrainian art to name it decolonization practice. Uh, I don't know, regarding um, different topics, uh, they were used like, let's, let's, I don't know, name it as like reappropriation or something, because usually decolonization is, uh, in Germany is a practice in optic used to African and for sure um, Asian and so on. So my question is, also about the term, do we need to invent our own term? Because in this meaning we're, we're maybe not as colony as it's colony it names in European practice of culture. And the second, uh, my question regarding all of that, uh, who is working with the uh, German institution? I really feel the pressure maybe of this very European colonial way of uh, how to say it properly, um, that they know better how to do, how to make this optics, how to, because they used to have this practice, yes? And as we know, with decolonial practice, each region, each country, each uh, war, each uh, um, specific, uh, they have their context, and usually uh, this approach of Western institutions, they usually paternalize. So we did it in that country, let's do the same in that country. So uh, 
question is about do you feel this pressure dealing with uh, German institutions uh, or uh, we really need to, I don't know, we need to vihrezate this our approach that we have really our own specific uh, in this term and we have the right of the voice in um, deconstructing this practice in our own um, this approach and our own um, Mm. Yes. <laughs> Our own yes. Uh, and uh, who wants to answer first? I can answer. Uh, Hannah? Uh, I can answer uh, uh, from my, uh, my uh, experience and profile. Uh, as to the term decolonization, uh, it uh, deals not uh, so with colonialism. And colonies and colonized and colon colonized and the colonizers, the history of colonialism, but the history of coloniality, which is a global phenomenon, phenomenon, and which touches Ukrainian not less than it touches Africa or Oceania, and we have our particular, very specific, very, very hybrid uh, histories, many. Uh, different histories of coloniality, and this coloniality is still very um, present in our culture. And um, it's a long uh, talk about, uh, uh, but we, when we speak about decoloniality and decolonial ideas and practices, for me it's very, very relevant to Ukraine, and I was um, writing and talking about it a lot, especially as a curator of Islamic art and partially as uh, responsible uh, for Asian art, Asian collection in Ukraine, in the Harenko Museum. I am decolonizing myself very actively through the last 10 years because the previous catalog and exhibition, permanent exhibition was done by me. Now I see very well how post Soviet was it, it was 2005, how post-colonial was it, and uh, there are plenty of uh, examples to it, how we deal with Buddhist art, with Islamic art, how we interpret, how we show human remains is, as our kapala, for instance, and talk about its beauty, of its uh, embellishment, and talk about philosophy of uh, Vajrayana, of Northern Buddhism, but we do not see there a person, uh, a, a human being, we dehumanize people, a person, a living being, human being, behind this object, and behind the history of its provenance, of its coming from Tibet to Ukraine, to the Hanenko Museum. So there are plenty of things to be decolonized and resort in this decolonial aspect. But this is a quite a different part of this um, movement to be um, accelerated is decolonization of Western museums, of Western uh, art, of Ukrainian art in Western museums, which uh, my colleagues have touched upon several times. It is very important to switch the labels, or even not the labels, because they um, picked uh, up now a very interesting way. They just raised any geographies from the labels, they just say um, Malevich and that's it, dates of birth and death and oil uh, on canvas. But when they talk, when they uh, publish, when they compile exhibitions, they still uh, connect uh, his uh, uh, work with some Russian context. So uh, we are to work very hard on that. And I know a lot of my colleagues who are doing this right now, so the changes are changes changes are being made. Probably. And what is the, was the second question? Was uh, it was about German institutions? Ah, me personally, I don't feel in my bulb <laughs> any uh, colonizing uh, approach. And uh, I but I work for TU, and it is very famous department. Uh, working, promoting restitution in Europe and Britain, it is the most active, I would say, um, uh, fighters for justice in the history of art. So these people are have been decolonizing themselves for 
very long and very profoundly. But I suppose that, um, for instance, you have a different experience, probably. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, basically, I will start at, uh, for myself, I define that it's uh, existing this, the, the colonization process inside in the country, which is started to be the, like to understand themselves as the colonized and also outside. And unfortunately, it happened that on the end, without outside, you cannot decolonize you to the end, like you cannot become finally the subject. And uh, on the beginning, I said that Vichy is working with the advocation of Ukrainian subjectivity, and it's basically what we are pushing. We are pushing this outside of Ukraine, this, the colonization process. And uh, in the example, even to push, um, to speak with Russians, uh, we see that we still not in this decolonized even not starting to be in this decolonized process. Of course, right now I speak more in general. Of course, it's not the case to each partner which we have. But basically, uh, just a week ago, Vice was pushed to speak with this uh, opposition, a politician from Russia, which for the world was coming to give the interview. I have forgot her name. Thank you, God. Uh, Um, it, what was that? Um, it was just recently the talk, even discussion with her. I'm so sad that I have forgot her name. I'm also happy in the same time. But anyway, to uh, to push to speak with them, to push uh, and right now this very dangerous move provoked by Russian propaganda to negotiation to get uh, finally to this agreement movement to stop this uh, struggle in uh, and we don't know which struggle is more matter for them the struggle of the prices or struggle of Ukrainians in the blackout. But uh, anyway, this is very dangerous when we are still forgetting and not given this uh, subjectivity and like the, even the floor to speak from their perspective. Or for example, it was very bad experience of one discussion where I, will, I was standing and basically uh, was, uh, we were speaking uh, uh, art in the time of war and there was everybody in panel except Ukrainians, just me, and it was like Belarusian speaking, it was like uh, the woman from the colonized uh, institute which said that uh, the colonized optic it could not be used to Ukrainian case. And uh, so basically, and you are sitting there and you are still continuing to fight to your subject, even to say that Lenin started genocide of Ukrainians, or even the right to say that today we have 5th uh, August and it's the day of commemoration of victims which was killed in Sandromach of Ukrainian uh, uh, Renaissance. And uh, so basically, yeah, we feel this, but I think it's because we're working in the different levels and uh, basically, as I said, we cannot get this and to touch to each partners which we have or the each person who we are meeting for. But it's like, uh, I think um, to see, um, if it's the co this outsider of like, I mean, uh, the person outside of Ukraine has already this decolonized optic, uh, could be that before the full-scale invasion or before 2040, it could be the ask if Holodomor is genocide. It's a huge question right now to Bundestag if we are decolonized in their optic. And the next question after 2014 will be the question, is Crimea uh, occupied, temporarily occupied by Russia? And the uh, next question will be uh, the war. Does it was the war which started Russia in the East Ukraine? And in this we can see if it's like the colonized optic or not. And unfortunately, it's still it's a hard question for a lot of who inviting us and to push into this discussion with this uh, Russian intellectual to discuss the peace in Ukraine, the situation in Ukraine, how to say in cultural heritage in Ukraine. Thank you, Yava. And um, I think uh, each speaker is so uh, powerful in and in different ways. And I think we should have should had had should have had 
uh, not a discussion, but mostly lectures from each of you, because there are so many topics which I want to touch more, but we're out of time a little bit, and I think everyone is a little bit tired of this whole information to head it in the head. And I want to end our discussion uh, about cultural heritage and its preservation with a small uh, slogan uh, or some small dream in one sentence. How you see, uh, if you can imagine uh, the future and the ideal image of preserved cultural heritage. Just what you imagine, what what you have imagined in your head, and how you can describe it with words, it will be the perfect closure. Because then we will dream all together about those images, and maybe some of them will come true. I um, would uh, say probably about the an ideal museum of future, uh, because I I think. Museums. <laughs> I would. Uh, I imagine myself museum uh, very inclusive, very open, and uh, knowing and telling diff very different stories. Not only the stories about European or certain Asian cultures, but very small, if it's possible to say, but uh, at the same time very big total cultures which uh, we have never even learned, read about, which were silenced, but we um, can find them in the Hanenko Museum or in some museum, and uh, we can encounter them and learn from these cultures. And also, uh, it is very inclusive, not only in its topics and narratives, but um, about I I in concern of people who are welcomed, who, are, who feel happy here, who feel, feel empowered in this museum, who just come to stay and to, to you know, uh, indulge themselves in, in their life and their being in love. It's so something like that. Um, I definitely want to see also this war and really complicated situation which we are living and going through as a chance because now what we have are this broken broken windows and as a symbol like broken dreams as a, this is the name of uh, one project also contemporary Ukrainian artist Alexis Zolotar. Um, but this also like a broken Im illusions yeah, that we all had about empire, center, Russia, Ukraine, also stereotypes, and etc. So that's why I really want to see that as a chance, so that uh, Ukraine will be decolonized, and the, we will decolonize ourselves because we really so many pages were hidden from us, um, and it's still a process we are going through. That and we can go much deeper and learn from each other together with our international partners, definitely. And I think that. Um, this case is really important also for the rest European countries with also imperialistic past and especially Germany, uh, which we had a lot of so many bones. And I definitely dream uh, that um, Ukraine will welcome more um, our international colleagues uh, and uh, in particular Art Matters Ukraine residency, which I started last year in November, will continue, and hosted first artists will continue. Uh, and that's what I feel now, even um, so many colleagues are asking, ah, oh, maybe we should go with you, and now to Kiev, to Ukraine, to Kharkiv. Um, so yeah, this free and uh, international dialogue that we can build, and again, discovering each other and learning from each other and reaching each other. Uh, from myself, I want to say that I s want to see in the future that after all our different experience, um, we will have home. Everybody of us will have home, an old one, a new one, beloved one, and we will have an enough um, energy and love to create and support what is already done. 
that's what I see. Yeah. I have a metaphor and not metaphor. Uh, so the metaphor will be that um, there will be more uh, partners of Ukraine, as Akut, as Pilatsky Institute, as many others who are supporting Ukrainian institution, as was uh, Vichy supported, as got in exile supported uh, in Berlin, who will be uh, given the voices uh, to Ukraine when they will be speaking about Ukraine not uh, to um, take in them. And uh, I have not metaphoric one, it's uh, because of the recent events. And um, for me, the f this, what I'm dreaming about, that not just Shevchenko in Avdivka will be safe, but also they will rebuild this amazing uh, museum, which they have started to build in 2000, after the occupation and after they managed to protect the city for long three years, more or less, which was destroyed by phosphor bombs as each house in Avdivka, and that the people who are protecting right now the city will be able to do this by themselves. I will not tell you my dream, because I'm a moderator, uh, but I will... <laughs> Uh, but I will say thank you to all of our speakers and one more clap in for all of them. <laughs> and also, uh, as Yev already mentioned, a huge thank you to Goethe Institute and Goethe Institute in Exil. And also when we were talking about, for example, cultural heritage and its preservation, uh, Goethe Institute also did a lot uh, in this uh, field, uh, especially their project House of Europe that uh, sent a lot of equipment, what uh, Hanna was talking about, uh, to the museums to protect their heritage. So a huge thank you for all of our partners. Thank you. And thank you for the audience. Yeah.